So, um, as Setwinder rightly introduced, I'm going to be talking about how living together um, can encourage neighbourliness um, and how architects can do that through the designs, how policy makers do that through the way that they uh, request changes to planning permissions, etc., but also how residents can do that once they move into a site. So, thinking about the making of uh, new housing, not just as something which planners and builders and architects do, but also something that residents do. If I do something like that. Um, so I'm going to be talking about two neighbourhoods. Um, on the left is the Wintels, uh, which is in Shropshire. Um, and the, this was a new development of 40 dwellings. Um, the first buildings were built around 2007, um, 20 houses were built within the first year and then another 20 were planned for later. Um, on the right hand side you've got Allerton Bywater, um, which is just outside Leeds, um, so a bit further north. Um, and that was a development of 520 new houses. Um, it was an urban extension. Uh, built as part of the Millennium Communities program. So you might have heard of Greenwich, which is one of the Millennium Communities. This was the second one, which is out in Bywater. It's not talked about very much because I think, um, I think they got a lot of things wrong there and people don't like to talk about it when they get things wrong. Anyway, um, so uh, the two developments were both um, designed as eco-houses. Uh, the one, the Wintels, was very much um, an idealist developer. This was their second ever development um, and they were coming at it with lots of um, high ideas about how people should share their tools and uh, should want to do gardening together and all of those things. Um, Out in Bywater, on the other hand, volume house builders, uh, three different builders, so there was Barrett's, Miller's and Fleming Fusion. Um, and uh, English partnerships were very heavily involved, so, uh, and it was really seen as a precursor where people were testing out some of the ideas which have now been designed into the Code for Sustainable Homes document. Um, my relationship with the projects, um, I was doing my PhD at the time, um, looking at socio-technical studies, so how policy actors, so um, architects or users um, and buildings interact, so not just thinking as uh, people having an effect on a building, but also buildings having an effect on a people. If you're interested in the ideas of social technical studies, other people you might want to read are si um, Simon Guy, who's a professor in Manchester, or Elizabeth Show's work. Uh, she's a professor in sociology at Lancaster. Um, so for both of these projects, uh, the thing that joins them together is they both had aspirations to make a sustainable community, uh, to make somewhere where people would want to live in the long term, but also which were eco in some way or another. So um, the Wintels, passive solar heating, natural ventilation, um, thinking about things like embodied energy, local materials. Uh, whereas out in Bywater was very much around modern methods of construction. So how can we build it fast? How can we build it cheap? Um, but, you know, hoping to be energy efficient. In lots of ways, out in Bywater um, became something which was uh, the same buildings that you'd find on any other estate designed by Barrett's, just with slightly more insulation, uh, AAA rated uh, white goods, um, and very little to differentiate it. But we'll talk a bit more about that. So if I can have the next slide. Um, so I'll talk about the Wintels first, and then we'll go on to Alison by water. Um, so this is a quote uh, from the developer of the Living Villages Trust, who were the people who um, put in the design proposals for the Wintels. Um, and this was uh, a quote before uh, they got the site. So someone else had put in a planning application for this site, and this was his critique of that planning application. So I'm going to read it out to you. It says... It is a sad example of ugly and imagine oh it should say unimaginative, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> ugly and unimaginative housing, uh, which creates a suburban oh it's going off your screen as well, sorry, I don't know why it does that. Dismal atmosphere. And we certainly don't need any of that more of this. There aren't forty executives living in um, who need homes in this town. The, this would further destroy the character of the town. People visit this place for its originality, its character, its beauty, which is quickly being eroded. The proposed houses would not contribute to this community at all. 
So he's taking a very strong idea where uh, he's saying that the, the planning application which was there, despite it bringing more people in, possibly people who have jobs, can bring in money from outside, they're not going to, people don't equal community in his mind. They're not going to add anything to that place. He goes on, he says, we are fed up with the bungalow blight and the boring 70s style housing estates, be them executive or not. If something must be built on this site, why not something that will enhance the town, support the local community, made of materials from sustainable resources, eco-houses, which represent homes of the present and the future, which can be an example of healthy living um, rather than repeating endlessly our past mistakes. Um, so he, he was, I mean, I think partly he was writing this letter in the hopes that they would be able to buy the site and get planning permission on it in the future, but very um, derogatory of um, housing for housing's sake, um, and seeing that for him, a sustainable house meant a uh, house within the community. It wasn't an isolated house, it was uh, a place that brought people together. Can have the next slide? Um, so he is very interested in a sense of place. So on the left-hand side, you have um, the, the local town, the town within which this development is situated. So it's full of these uh, shuts and alleyways, little passages uh, where people are brought very close together. So tight spaces where you rub up against your neighbour. And then on the right-hand side is the development as it was built. Um, and as you can see, they try to mimic uh, the town layout in terms of having little winding paths. Um, next slide. Um, oh, awesome. Okay. Um, so this is a quote um, from a letter uh, from a local resident to the planning authority um, saying what they thought about uh, the planning application. He says, the town is a popular place uh, for tourists, drawn by the beauty of the architecture and the layout. It still has shuts and winding alleys and old buildings that are lived in. It feels like the spirit of Bishop's Castle could too easily be concreted over. I'm not some dippy hippie eco-protester, but a working man who supports his family and the local community. So again, you can see these ideas of community. Sorry, I love these quotes. I really do try to pick them. Um, you can see these ideas of being community played out, that actually something has to talk, um, has to embody uh, this local place in order to feed the local community. Um, so we move on, and people have moved into the site. Um, so I've got two residents uh, who I again will read a quote for you. Um, so Michael, one of the residents, he says, um, and there was thought gone, um, and there has been thought gone in, or appeared to be thought gone into the layout of the site itself. So instead of having a row of houses and another row of houses, they're higgledy piggledy, which it creates um, a sense of space around the houses to an extent in a small space, but also means you see more people around. And so the events we've had have been on the green across there. And the fact that the houses are all around it, people can just come out of their houses and you're on the green. So I think it's been well planned and it's been well thought out. And I don't think it would have been done so well if it had just been uniform, all the houses the same in rows, and no additional land like the orchard or the allotments. I think it's the whole package that really attracts people to this place. Um, and then Adam, another resident from, I should say I've changed all their names by the way. Um, Adam, another resident, on the site, he says, it's a bit like a film set, isn't it? Um, somehow you feel like you want to eat them, the houses, um, because they're made of marzipan. And I think to some extent, I've named this slide, slide a fairy tale. These people are wanting to live in their idealised utopian community. They've got this idea that if they um, have a, a, a small area of grass outside the houses, that'll be somewhere where they all come together. And to some extent, they do. They have Christmas tree in that park, uh, they have mince pies and singing around the Christmas tree, um, and it has been a place where, yes, it's architectural determinism, the architecture says how they're going to use that space, but actually they've taken it on and above what was designed there. Um, next slide. Um, so apart from having uh, shops and alleyways, um, the design of the place was that you would have very high density on the land itself, so the houses are very close together with the idea that you might be able to wave across to someone else in their kitchen as you're walking past, which meant that uh, they had a lot of excess land around the outside that they've used for allotments and orchards. 
Um, so this is some of their growing with the houses in the background. Um, and again, it was designed as a meeting place. So the idea is that growing your own vegetables uh, can add to sustainability, but also that actually getting rid of um, isolation and creating community will also um, create sustainability. Now, the sad thing about the allotments are is that whilst uh, the designers had in mind that everyone would uh, grow together and there would be no separation. They've actually gone down a more traditional allotment route and have allocated pieces of land to each other um, because they just found that people weren't committing or able to commit the same amount of time. So in some ways that hasn't worked as well as it could have done. The other um, unusual thing about the site, uh, the site is that all the centre where the houses are is pedestrianised um, and so all the cars are left around the periphery of the site um, in these car barns. Now a car barn might sound very uh, quaint and rural um, but really it's just a shed where you put your car. Um, and I think, but I think it, it for the people who live there, it evokes this notion of um, their idyll. Um, and again, it's the idea that if you leave your car on the edge of the site and you have to walk past other people's houses, you might bump into them. Um, in some ways, it has uh, been successful. Um, in others, uh, people on the site, as I was interviewing them, reported uh, that they felt almost more isolated because they could see all of these other people talking to one another, and for some reason they weren't included. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it, but it, it can happen. Um, and then others who moved into the site initially, within the first year, had already resold their house and moved on because it never met up to their ideals. Um, and so I think you have to be very careful when you're designing places like this because people um, will buy into the ideals of the developer or the designer um, and then may feel let down or may not feel that they're able to live up to it. Um, so if I then talk about um, Alison Bywater. Um, so as I said, a development of 520 houses, three developers, um, part of the Millennium Communities Programme. Um, and you can see their aim is to connect you and the environment. Um, so, can I go two slides? Only oh, one. There we go. We'll go to that one. Um, so, the Millennium Communities Program was really uh, part of John Prescott's brainchild um, of how can we uh, re-establish um, new ways uh, of promoting sustainable building amongst uh, volume house builders. Um, and the initial proposals for this site look something like this. Um, and there was a um, public display of the proposals. Um, and basically, the local residents uh, went along to the display and basically said things like, what's a car barn? So, sorry, I, I didn't choose both the sites just because they got car barns, but it just happened to happen that way. Um, and you see, they, they live just outside Leeds. It's a ex-mining community, um, and things like car barns sound very exotic. Um, and they were worried about um, how, how such things would integrate into their existing community. Um, it was a small village of around 2,000 people, which was extended. Um, sorry, it's on the next slide, in fact, so we can do that. Um, so it was initially a village of 500 1,580 households, which was going to be extended to over 2,100 households. For, so for them, this wasn't an urban extension on the edge of Leeds. For them, it was their village growing by an extra 25%. Um, so read uh, another quote uh, from Building Magazine, um, which basically describes how the uh, local residents saw this scheme. They said the re those residents who went to the design consultation meetings had other concerns. First, they were foxed by architectural jargon. What on earth were glazed ecological streets and car barns? What was all this timber cladding? And how would it cope with Yorkshire weather? Um, so they, they were totally confused by what was going on here. And I think another thing, if you're thinking about how your architecture can really encourage community relationships, it's learning to talk the community's language. Next, sorry. Thank you. Um, 
And so it raises questions about whose responsibility it was um, to get the local residents on side with new ways of living sustainably. Um, so another magazine article said, the developer consortium was ac accused of not explaining the benefits of the scheme to residents. Some in the community were not ready for the innovative features planned for the site, and as a result, many of the modern features were toned down, and the homes were made more traditional in appearance. Um, so this is how the houses turned out. So they went from those uh, moody pictures that we saw two slides ago uh, to houses that looked like traditional brick terraced housing. Um, so in the picture on the right, you can see uh, the slate roof and a window in the centre. That's an existing house. Um, and then the houses to the left and to the right of that, they're the new houses. And you can see how it fits in. Um, I'm not going to say beautifully to the um, surrounding houses, but it mimics them. Uh, it doesn't try to do anything uh, innovative or trendy. The only occasional bits that you get that say this might be a new house with eco features are things like the uh, timber window on the left-hand side. Next slide. Um, so the whole area of Alison Bywater um, was designed around a home zone. So this picked up some of the original ideas of these ecological streets um, and reinterpreted them into a home zone. A home zone, if you don't know, is um, a place where you have a shared pavement. So rather than having a, a shared surface, so rather than having pavements and roads for cars, everyone is on the same surface. Um, again, similar ideas to what we saw at the Wintels, ideas that people would walk past each other, that because uh, drivers would have to gain eye contact with pedestrians to try and figure out where they were going, um, or kids could play out on the street because there was no defined area that said, you're only allowed this one metre strip of pavement. Um, actually, they could play ball games across everywhere if there weren't ca cars there at the time. Um, so the idea that you would have more exchange and therefore more community spirit built up. Next slide. Um, now, some residents really praised this idea. Um, they said that... Um, I f uh, so this is Pat. She says that, I feel that when the house was sold to me, um, the salesman did a very good job of saying, this will be about families, about community, about open space for everyone. And um, they were really selling that idea. Um, and I feel that everyone who's moved into, into this site has got that same philosophy. And, have the, and to some extent, um, there's a community um, that's generated a community feel. So you can see that she's really taken on board these ideas. What she's been sold, what she believes the site is going to be, um, is what she... Uh, experiences at. Can we go two clicks? Sorry. Oh, no, sorry, back one click. <laughs> sorry. Um, so, uh, this is what it looks like. So you see that you come out of your house, there's a very tiny bit, uh, which is, thank you, um, a tiny strip outside your front door, which is your land, and then everything is one surface. Next slide. Um, some residents, however, have got incredibly frustrated by this. Um, so this is Tanya. Um, I'm not going to read the slide on this one because I'm running out of time. Um, but she's hugely disappointed. She feels that this isn't safe. Her kids can't go and play on this road because people don't slow down. That there's no speed limits, there's no signs saying that this should be a 20 mile an hour zone. Um, and there's nothing um, to dis dissuade drivers uh, from uh, driving in a way that may danger endanger her children on the road. Next slide. Okay, and another one. Okay, um, this is my penultimate slide. Um, however, some people on the site um, have found it inspiring. Uh, so this is a family that I interviewed, um, and they'd also got themselves in a local newspaper, which is why I'm allowed to show you photos of them. Um, and they were people who... Um, had not just taken on the ideas which the designers had put in there, so things about the shared pavements, um, but they'd actually started their own campaigns. There was no recycling on the site when they moved in. As crazy as that seems, moving into an eco neighbourhood, uh, there's no recycling. So these guys campaigned for it. They got involved in the local community supported agriculture scheme, um, and they set themselves up as people who would educate their neighbours. Um, so in some ways, they were doing a lot more for their neighbours uh, than perhaps the development was. Can we go into the last slide? Okay, so as part of my research, I came up with this model. So it's based 
on a model by Kubler-Ross, um, who has written about the psychology of bereavement. And obviously, I'm not talking about death and dying. Um, however, I think there's a similar um, process that people can go through. So when someone dies, um, Kubler-Ross suggests that people go through denial, they say no one's died, um, they go through frustration, how can this person have left me? Uh, they go through exploration about what life might mean afterwards, um, and then there's a process of transformation where life changes and they start again. Um, I would argue in similar ways, when we're thinking about how do we transition to a more resilient future, we're going through a similar process. Um, that we're going through a process where we uh, deny that climate change is happening, uh, we get frustrated that we have to use uh, less energy, um, we explore different ways of living, different ways of doing community, be that through growing vegetables, be that through uh, shared tool banks or car barns, um, and then we can go through a process of transformation. Um, so in a small way, I've seen that on the two developments that I looked at, um, but I think in a much broader way, uh, that is also maybe what we're seeing nationally and internationally. Okay, thank you.